I am your host, James Morgan, and this is History of Cities. Episode 8, The Circling Vultures We last left off with the end of the First Macedonian War, in which Philip V of Macedon faced off against Rome and its Greek allies. The war had been sparked by Philip's alliance with the Carthaginians, who were at that point looking to conquer the Roman homeland. The intervention of Roman legions and a coalition of independent Greek states prevented Philip from linking up with the Carthaginian general, Hannibal, in Italy, but were unable to force any concessions from the Macedonians. In the end, despite having lost the war on paper, the Romans had achieved their most important goal, at the price of some measly land in Illyria. This war was the first major engagement between the Romans and the Greeks that took place in Greece and would certainly not be the last. In 205 BC, the Peace of Phonis had marked the end of the First Macedonian War, but the ambitious king of Macedon was still not content with the territory he currently ruled over. A year later, the king of Egypt died and left his infant son in charge of the expansive and rich Egyptian kingdom. Philip and the ruler of the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus, both saw this as a golden opportunity to nab some land while their rival was weak. Antiochus took land directly from Egypt as he shared a border with them, while Philip primarily focused on the independent cities in Thrace and Anatolia that had been guaranteed by the Egyptians. These aggressive expansions of the Macedonian sphere of influence made the kingdom of Pergamon and the island of Rhodes very nervous. They had supported Rome in the First Macedonian War, and harbored no delusions about how Philip felt about them. Now his borders stretched right up to their doorstep, and they could sense which way the tide was pulling. Macedonia was still too powerful for Pergamon and Rhodes to face alone, so they sent envoys to Rome to request assistance in stifling a Macedonian resurgence. At this time, the Romans had just concluded peace terms with Carthage in the Second Punic War, it had been a war to the death for both states, and Rome had very nearly lost it all. Their eventual victory in the dismantling of the Carthaginian Empire did very little to distract them from the reality that Hannibal had had free reign in Italy for 15 years before he was forced to return to Africa. As a result of walking this tightrope between victory and utter defeat, the Romans were more cautious than their previous nature had been. Instead of responding to the envoys from Pergamon and Rhodes with an immediate declaration of war on Macedonia, they sent a representative of the Senate to observe the situation in Greece and report back with a recommendation of action. The representative that the Senate sent in 201 BC was Marcus Valerius Levinus. He had led the Roman fleet during the First Macedonian War and was well versed in the politics of Greece. When he arrived in Greece, the situation had deteriorated precipitously since the envoys had left Pergamon and Rhodes. In their absence, a minor feud between Macedonian ally Archanania and the previously neutral state of Athens had led to an all-out war between Philip and a coalition of southern Greek states. This sudden escalation in hostilities must have frustrated and worried the neutral, independent trading cities like Byzantium. They had worked so hard to bring peace to the region in the First Macedonian War, and now less than five years later, it looked like another massive war would once again disrupt their lucrative trade routes. Byzantium would have had conflicting views on this situation, as they did not want war so that they could continue overseeing all trade between the Black and Mediterranean seas. On the other hand, Philip's recent conquests in Thrace had stopped just before reaching Byzantium, but there was always the chance that if he was victorious in another large-scale Greek war, then Byzantine independence would be next on the chopping block. Byzantium's concerns over this second point were likely assuaged when Levinus sent his report back to Rome, recommending them to intervene in what he saw as a perfect opportunity to break the momentum of the ascendant Macedonian kingdom. This recommendation was met with mixed feelings back in Rome, where a large part of the political body was wary of getting involved in another conflict so soon after the Second Punic War. When the Roman consuls first asked for a vote on the declaration of war, they were resoundingly rejected. But a second later attempt was successful, and an army was hastily formed and sent to Apollonia on the eastern coast of the Adriatic. Meanwhile, as the Romans debated on whether or not to go to war, Philip had continued his conquest of the cities surrounding Byzantium and the Dardanelles. In a particularly brutal siege, 
he informed the inhabitants of the city of Abydos that he would storm their city in three days if any of them wanted to commit suicide or surrender before then. In response, the men of the city murdered all the women and children rather than see them be enslaved by the Macedonians, and then went into a suicidal frenzy against the besieging army. After this horrific event, Philip returned to Macedonia, where he was informed that the Roman army had landed in Apollonia. The Second Macedonian War was in full swing now, and Philip found himself in a familiar position, facing off against a coalition of Greek states that circle Macedonia like vultures, while their benefactors from Rome supported them from the sea and threatened invasion from the north. But Philip was not worried. He had beaten them last time they had tried this, and he would surely beat them again. During the last few campaign months in 200 BC, the Macedonian armies went on a scorched earth rampage across southern Greece. Unable to find a chance to decisively knock out one of his major opponents, Philip contented himself with rampant destruction of Athenian lands and burning cities on strategically important islands. The Roman strategy at this point in time was a two-front assault in northwestern and southern Macedonia. The main body of the Roman land force was commanded by a consul named Sulpicius, and he employed diplomacy to turn the subjugated tribes of Upper Macedonia against their overlords. He successfully enlarged his army with these dissident tribes and set about systematically conquering Philip's northwestern flank. Philip's response to this invasion was unable to find a decisive battle, and he was forced to split his army when another tribe in the north rebelled. Rather than face the massive Roman army under Sulpicius with his divided force, Philip sent one contingent to deal with the rebellious tribe, while he marched south to deal with the other prong of the Roman invasion. The Roman fleet was responsible for the southern campaign, and had linked up with their Greek allies to wreak havoc on Macedonian-controlled islands in the Aegean Sea. The success of this southern campaign eventually drew the neutral Aetolian League to the Roman side. Not wanting to get left behind as the vultures picked away at the Macedonians, the Aetolian armies invaded southern Macedonia by land and easily spread death and destruction as there was no army to oppose them. However, Philip's northern army had swiftly arrived and caught the invaders by complete surprise. In the first decisive battle of the war, the Macedonians completely routed the Aetolian League, but were unable to follow up on this victory as the campaign season drew to a close. It is at this point that I would like to mention that Roman consuls served a term of one year. This meant that sometimes during war, the Roman strategy would abruptly change as the commanders were shuffled with the changing political situation. However, the Roman strategy in the Second Macedonian War was fairly straightforward, so no drastic changes were made. All they had to do was use their numerical advantage to force Philip to split his forces by fighting on multiple fronts. Another consequence of this chronic changeover in leadership is that it can become quite confusing introducing each new consul, so I will try to keep that to a minimum and simply refer to the Romans in a more abstract form. Despite having just made this caveat, I would like to introduce the consul that would be prosecuting the remainder of the Second Macedonian War. Titus Quinctus Flamininus was one of the youngest ever consuls of the Roman Republic. Flamininus shared a characteristic with many later Roman rulers in that he was an avowed Philhellene, or in modern terms, a Greek fanboy. From his point of view, Macedonia threatened the sacred tradition of Greek independence and freedom, so fighting against them was the same as fighting for Greece. He was elected in 198 BC and jockeyed with his co-consul over which of them would have the honor of leading the war in Greece. It came down to a lottery, or basically a coin toss, in which Flamininus won. Upon taking command in Greece, Flamininus shifted the tone of the war by offering new peace terms to Macedonia. Previously, the war had just been about checking the growth of Macedonian influence by stopping Philip from conquering any more independent cities. However, with these new terms, the war took on a more punitive characteristic, as it imposed reparations on Philip and would force him to remove garrisons from non-Macedonian provinces inside the kingdom of Macedon. When these terms were presented to Philip at a peace conference, he became enraged and cursed his enemies as he stormed out. Hostilities quickly resumed. The first clash between Flamininus and Philip resulted in Roman victory, and Philip was forced to gather up the pieces of his shattered army while Flamininus was free to march through Thessaly. 
Compounding Philip's battlefield losses was the fact that many Greek states were eager to join the coalition against him, and every time he looked weak, more would flock to the vulture circle. This time, it was Epirus who added their armies to the Roman invasion force. Meanwhile, a successful naval campaign in southern Greece persuaded the longtime Macedonian allies, the Achaean League, to switch sides. The walls were closing in, and Philip sent word to Flamininus that he wanted to reopen peace negotiations at the close of the campaign season. These winter negotiations went nowhere, as Flamininus remained stalwart in his demands, and Philip, likewise, refused to give ground. Upon hearing that the Senate was extending the duration of Flamininus's command over the forces in Greece into the next year, Flamininus swiftly broke the diplomatic stalemate by leaving the negotiations to prepare for the spring campaign. With neither side willing to compromise in the negotiating room, the war would have to be decided by decisive and bloody battle out in the field. To ensure that this battle would be the strike that irrevocably tipped the scales, both sides amassed their full strength near Fury in Thessaly. Philip had to scrape the bottom of his manpower reserves, drafting veterans and young boys from all the lands he still controlled. On the other hand, Flamininus gathered his fresh troops from his Greek allies to supplement his reinforcements that had arrived from Rome. Each army was roughly of equal size, but Flamininus had the clear advantage in quality. Despite this advantage, in a terrain that favored the legionaries over the phalanx, Flamininus was hesitant to attack his enemy. Eventually, Philip was forced to break camp and march towards a nearby town for supply. Flamininus followed him closely, looking for any opportunity to strike. While marching towards the town of Scotusa, a heavy rain delayed both armies as they camped on opposite sides of a large hill. The rain brought a thick fog the next morning, and Philip was unable to continue the march, so he sent a contingent of infantry and cavalry up the hill to scout the Roman position. Additionally, he sent another contingent of heavy infantry to forage for food in the surrounding country. Flamininus had had a similar idea, as he sent a group up the hill to see if Philip had continued his march or was staying put. As a result of the low visibility due to the fog, the Roman and Macedonian scouting parties bumbled into each other and a small skirmish ensued. The smaller Roman force quickly sent word back to their camp that they were engaged with the enemy and needed reinforcements. When these reinforcements arrived, it was the Macedonians' turn to be on the back foot, and they requested that Philip send more troops to help them. This skirmish quickly spiraled out of control and eventually resulted in a full-scale battle on the plains outside the Roman camp. This battle, called the Battle of Sinocephaly, was one of the first instances where the weakness of the static Greek phalanx against the flexible Roman legion style was shown. The phalanx had dominated Greek infantry tactics for over 2,000 years, but soon the Romans would finally prove it to be obsolete. The decisive moment in the battle came when a large number of Roman legionaries were able to flank around the backside of the opposing phalanx and slaughtered the men who were unable to turn around in their static formation. In the end, the Macedonians lost more than half their men, sustaining almost 20 times the casualties the Romans had. This battle, as well as simultaneous smaller losses throughout the Macedonian realm, forced Philip to finally accept the Roman peace terms, ending the war and effectively ending Macedonia's time as a great power. The Romans portrayed the defeat of Macedonia and the breakup of their conquered territories as a victory for Greek freedom. In reality, it was more like the Greeks were now under new management, as the Roman legions maintained a presence in Greece and declared themselves to be the quote-unquote protectors of Greek freedom. This meant that the Romans had a pretense to involve themselves in any dispute in Greece and could mediate terms to their benefit. The Romans' Greek allies might have rejoiced at not having to worry about the Macedonian expansionism anymore, but the door had been opened to Rome, and they were not likely to leave absent a violent expulsion. If you recall, the whole mess of the Second Macedonian War was a result of a deal that Philip had made with the ruler of the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus III. This deal gave each state the freedom to expand their spheres of influence at the cost of the Egyptian holdings they bordered. So while Philip had invaded cities in Thrace in Asia Minor, sparking outrage among his Greek neighbors and igniting a war with Rome, Antiochus had kicked the Egyptians out of Syria and greatly expanded his southern border. 
Now that his partner in crime had been forced to give up the conquests in Asia Minor, Antiochus took the chance to gobble these up as well. This brought the Seleucids right up to the edge of the Roman sphere of influence. As the two great powers eyed each other, Cold War broke out the year after the Second Macedonian War ended. Disagreements over which state would be the dominant power in the Aegean all but guaranteed a massive conflict in the future. All of Greece now shared a fate that Byzantium was all too familiar with. They were a buffer zone between two opposing giants in the east and west, and it was inevitable that the resolution between the two would have to come at the cost of a lot of bloodshed. Ironically, both sides had declared themselves to be protectors of Greek freedom, but it was clear that either would use this mandate as a pretext to declare war on the other. During this Cold War period, the Romans and the Seleucids tried to sway as many of the neutral Greek states to their side in order to tip the scales in their favor. This expansion of their alliance networks would eventually be the catalyst that heated the war to its boiling point. In 195 BC, the Roman garrisons that had stayed in Greece since the end of the Second Macedonian War left, and gave Antiochus the perfect opportunity to step into the vacuum. So in 194, Seleucid armies crossed the Hellespont into Europe and conquered Byzantium along with the rest of Thrace. The Romans protested this obvious breach in the de facto agreement they had with the Seleucids, in which either power would stay off the other side of the Aegean. A new agreement was reached when the Seleucids were allowed to keep Thrace, but Antiochus had to promise not to expand any further to the west. This deal was agreeable to both parties, as neither really wanted a full-scale war in which there was a chance they could lose everything. The minor Greek states were less enthusiastic about peace, as they believed they could leverage a great power conflict to their advantage. To this end, the Aetolian League sought to stir the pot by threatening the Achaean League. In response, the Achaeans looked to Rome to fulfill their mandate as protectors of Greek freedom. On the other hand, the Aetolians sent envoys to Antiochus, telling him that the minor Greek states yearned for him to save them from the tyranny of Rome. Antiochus was receptive to this plea, and he landed an army in southern Greece, proclaiming that he was here to expel Roman influence. Romans saw this action as a direct threat to their interests, and in 191 BC, the Roman Seleucid War went from cold to scorching hot. Contrary to what the Aetolians had told Antiochus, most of the Greeks were quite content with the status quo under Roman protection, so as the Seleucids marched through Thessaly, they were met by more resistance than they had anticipated. This was even before the Roman legions arrived in Greece, and did not bode well for the future of the war. It seemed like Antiochus had been baited into a trap, albeit one that was not set intentionally by the Aetolian League, but at this point he was pot committed and elected to continue his quote-unquote liberation of Greece. As could have been predicted, the situation began to deteriorate quickly when Philip of Macedon took the destabilization of the Seleucid invasion as an opportunity to take back some of what he had lost in the Second Macedonian War. He marched on Antiochus's only friend, the Aetolians, which drew Antiochus north in an attempt to block him. Around this time, the Romans finally arrived in Thessaly, where they received a much more hospitable welcome. The arrival of the Romans forced the Seleucid army to do a 180 and march back south to face the now combined Roman and Greek armies. Despite being outnumbered, Antiochus believed he could use the famous pass at Thermopylae to negate his disadvantageous numerical situation. At this point, the pass was so famous that everyone knew its weaknesses. The Seleucid army was easily destroyed and Antiochus was forced to flee all the way back to the eastern side of the Aegean. This defeat had the further effect of turning the ever-fickle neutral Greek states against the Seleucids as they eagerly hopped on the bandwagon of the winning team. Without their key ally to protect them, the Aetolian League was swiftly surrounded by the vultures and braced themselves to be picked apart as the Macedonians had. They were no match for the Roman legions, and cities quickly fell without much of a fight. The Aetolians tried to sue for peace as the situation grew bleak, but negotiations with the Romans were inconclusive. There was a glimmer of hope, however, as Antiochus rebuilt his army back in Anatolia. He had an ace up his sleeve that he hoped would turn the tide of the war. Leading Antiochus' new fleet was a foreign general that had arrived in his court a few years ago. That general was the legendary Hannibal, whose name struck fear in the hearts of every Roman. 
The Seleucids opted for a two-pronged invasion this time in order to split the coalition forces. Hannibal would lead a fleet across the southern Aegean and land in Thessaly, while Antiochus marched an army north by land and crossed the Hellespont to invade from Thrace. Things went wrong almost immediately, as Hannibal's fleet was damaged while trying to cross the Aegean by the powerful Rhodian navy. The Rhodians then followed up on this by sailing to where the rest of the Seleucid navy was waiting for Hannibal and destroyed them. With the Romans now controlling the sea and the possibility of the crossing at the Hellespont being blockaded, Antiochus quickly withdrew from Europe. The Romans followed hot on his heels, preparing to reconquer Thrace as they went. But at this point, side-switching was second nature to the Thracians and Byzantines, and they waved at the Roman armies as they passed. Now fully on the back foot, Antiochus made an offer for peace in which he would pay a hefty sum of gold and renounce his claim to cities in Greece. But the Romans also saw the Greek cities in Anatolia as their protectorates and demanded Antiochus release them as well. This concession, combined with the demand for an even greater sum of money, was a step too far for Antiochus, and he made preparations to face the Romans on the battlefield. The Roman strategy was once again influenced by their unique command structure, as they aggressively looked to find a decisive battle before the end of the year and the swapping of leaders. On one hand, it encouraged aggressive offensive maneuvers as the consuls sought to find glory before their term was up, but on the other hand, it could have spelled disaster for the invasion of Asia Minor if the Seleucids were able to defeat them. The two armies met in the field outside Magnesia in December of 190 BC. Both sides had around equal numbers, but the battle was decided by superior Roman tactics. Just like Philip's defeat in the Battle of Cynocephaly, a flanking maneuver caught the static Seleucid phalanx off guard and easily cut them down. The battle had done what the Roman consuls had hoped for, it brought glory and an end to the Seleucid War. Except, the defeat of Antiochus was not the end of the war, because somehow the Aetolians were still holding on in Greece. They were still fighting despite the hopelessness of victory, because the Roman offer for peace terms was a price they could not possibly pay. After the Rhodians managed to talk their allies into a more reasonable position, the Aetolian League finally surrendered in 189 BC. These new terms cost the Aetolians half of what the previous offer had been, but it also forced them to become a Roman client state. So much for protecting the freedom of all Greeks. With the subjugation of the Aetolian League, the Romans had taken a big step towards total domination of Greece. After finally subduing the Aetolians, the Romans were able to finalize peace terms with Antiochus in 188 BC. As to be expected, the terms that were enforced upon the Seleucids were steep. They were forced to give up large swaths of their western territories to Rome's allies in Pergamon and Rhodes. They had to pay a crippling indemnity of 15,000 talents or pieces of gold. The Seleucid army and navy were restricted in their sizes and composition. No more war elephants. In order to guarantee that Antiochus would stay true to these terms after the Roman legions left, he was forced to give 20 hostages, including his son, to Rome. He was also ordered to give up Roman enemies he had been sheltering, like Hannibal, but Hannibal was able to escape before being handed over and would continue opposing the Romans until his dying day. The long-term effect of the Roman Seleucid War was that the Seleucids would never again expand westward. For now, Byzantium would not have to worry about a great empire in the east as the Seleucid Empire went into a steady freefall which culminated in their collapse just 80 years after Antiochus' death in 187 BC. On the flip side, Byzantium must have been very nervous about their neighbors to the west. In the course of less than 15 years, the Romans had defeated two major Greek powers without having a single Greek soldier set foot on the Italian peninsula. They had also multitasked by conquering all the formerly Greek cities in Sicily, including the great city of Syracuse. The ascendant Romans seemed unstoppable, and even a fully united Greece might not have been enough to beat them. Long past were the days of Alexander the Great, and the Greeks were far from united. That does not mean that future generations would not attempt to throw the western invaders out of Greece, but with the fall of Macedonia and the Seleucid Empire, the Hellenic world had lost its two best chances. The end of the Second Macedonian War had seen the Romans content with keeping the Greek kingdoms around as a buffer between them and the east, 
But the subsequent war with the Seleucids and Aetolians led to the Romans shifting their gaze eastward. The establishment of the Aetolian client state gave Rome a stake in the region and moved the eastern policy further towards one of overt annexation rather than buffer zone. While the southern and central Greek states might bemoan this loss of their freedom, Byzantium and the other neutral trade cities were likely more of an apathetic mood. Sure, they had a solid Hellenic identity, but their far-reaching trade networks had brought a certain level of multiculturalism to them. There were certainly citizens of Byzantium who were sympathetic to Roman Republic influence, and even some that were outright pro-Roman annexation. After all, who really cares which banner flies over your head, as long as the trade keeps flowing and the money keeps growing? Byzantines were not nearly as militaristic or powerful as their Greek cousins in Macedon, Egypt, or the East, and as a result, they were not seen as a threat by the Romans. On the contrary, as long as they kept the Bosporus open to Roman merchants, they were an asset in the region and would be treated much more kindly. In the next episode, we will see how over the course of the next 40 years, the Romans will not treat rebellious Greek states with this much kindness, as they gradually annex more and more territory until all of Greece becomes a Roman province. As always, if you have any questions or think I missed anything, please feel free to email me at hofcpod.cast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter at hofc underscore podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please join me next time for the history of Byzantium.